points for the season which means that it broke its own record at each meet. Pretty amazing thing that a, that a car was able to do that back in the 40s. Okay I'm Kurt Giovanni. I'm uh, Bob Giovanni's son. He was one of the partners in this in this car with Chuck Spurgeon. They started running the car in the, in, shortly after the war. Uh, I looked for the old car and I lost track of it. And then it wound up somewhere out here in the desert. And uh, when I saw what was found in the desert, it's unbelievable that it could ever come back to this condition. First time in 68 years, I believe, this car's been on the El Mirage dirt in this form. It's beautiful. Coming back with the Spurgeon Giovannini car is, is just really special. And the other thing is, this is a, a epic reunion, having Kurt here and, and, and the car coming back after all these years. Not only was it cool in breaking records at every other six meets in 1948, but looking at the car, it is absolutely stunning. Okay, I'm Kurt Giovanni. I'm uh, Bob Giovanni's son. He was one of the partners in this in this car with Chuck Spurgeon, and uh, also had crew members Bob Rufi and Duke Halleck that contributed a lot to this car and and how well it ran back in the '40s. And they started they started running the car in the, at, shortly after the war and. Uh, it was in the high boy state then, and then they gradually modified it, channeled it, brought it down, put a belly pan on it. Chuck built the nose. Uh, they used to use Bob Rufi's surplus army ambulance to tow the car out here to the lake, to tow it to get it started, and as a support vehicle. Got a perfect score, 1,800 points for the season, which means that it broke its own record at each meet. And the significant thing then was now it takes one run to set a record over an existing record. Back then it took three runs. It took a qualifying run and then an average of two directions. I believe their, their first of the year was around 116, 118, somewhere in the last speed for the last meet was 123, I believe. And so it's a pretty amazing thing that a, that a car was able to do that over an entire season. They, pro they finally sold the car in, Chuck sold it in 52, 51 or 52, and the engine was sold about the same time. The engine belonged to my dad and the car was Chuck's. And uh, it's amazing, it's, it's, it's unbelievable to see the car in the condition it's in now. Uh, I looked for the old car and I lost track of it. And uh, 
they said, you know, the old car had been found. Well, we had just finished the, the new car. And they asked Dad, are you interested? And he says, no, <laughs> not interested. But the car had gone through, uh, Carl Borg turned it into a rear engine GMC powered car. Um, the original nose was disposed of. He put a different nose on the front of it. The original rear end was gone. The car changed completely. And then he sold it to uh, Bob Cano, who drug, uh, drag raced it for a short period of time. And then it wound up somewhere out here in the desert. And uh, when I saw what was found in the desert, it's unbelievable that it could ever come back to this condition. Ernie and and the people that he had involved getting it back to this condition and Jim with the engine and so forth and the carburation changes. It's it's really amazing. It's amazing to see it running and driving with Ernie behind the wheel and, and just having fun, enjoying it. The Spurgeon Giovanni car makes a huge impact on my life. There's been these other famous vehicles that have been very well publicized. By and large, it's been kind of hidden. And I think that's some of the beauty and charm is when, you know, um, Ernie and Elaine brought this car back and they, they knew uh, the significance of this car. And the, the 1948 season when this ran out here at El Mirage, uh, to have a perfect score, 1,800 points, I believe, to every pass go faster, every meet break its own record. This car has, has not been really showcased in the light it should be. It's such a famous, incredible car. And, and again, you know, I, I love my Fords and the flatheads and all that. This car, to be running a, a four-cylinder 1925 Chevrolet engine, Nobody was running the Chevrolets. It was the Albata Club and a lot of the gentlemen involved in that club that knew how to make the horsepower. What these guys were able to pull off is just this side of a miracle. And to see it sitting here today, wow, it's just uh, something very special. One of their racing friends who also had a car, you've probably seen pictures of it, was Ralph Shank. And uh, Ralph Shank was basically a Ford man, but he in running circle track, he had learned that the Chevy's four cylinders could be modified and made to run really well. So he was the one that came up with, with some of the things that he showed them how to drill through, drill the, uh, the front main bearing bolts all the way through the block and to put a support piece on there so that you could get more strength in the front main bearing, drill the center main bearing through and use that to get more support by putting the bolts all the way through. One of the things Bob Rufi came up with was he happened to go by the, the uh, surplus outlets for, for World War I surplus and he found that uh, Jenny aircraft rods from the OX-5, which was a V-8 used in the Jenny airplane, he could buy those rods for I think it was 35 cents a piece, and so they took those, they took those rods, and then they used a, a Model C Ford crankshaft that was counterweighted. And the problem with doing that is that Chevy has Siamese pairs of cylinders, one and two, and then a space in three and four. And the cylinder spacings on a Chevy are different than on a Ford. So what they would do would, would they could get the crank in there. It was the three main bearings would line up. The problem is they had to offset grind the rods so that the rods would line up with the, the cylinders. And they, they use those OX-5 rods. The rods are really, really pretty out of, the, out of that OX-5 engine. And they were inexpensive. And then dad designed and had some pistons cast up that they used to put on the top of the, of the rod. And then they had uh, Ed Winfield ground the camshaft for it. And then the head that they used was an old three port, called an old head, although it was used on some Chevrolet engines. It makes it breathe a lot better. 
has uh, two intake ports and three exhaust ports. Um, Roy Creel, who runs four cylinders, says that it's like trying to make horsepower out of a tissue paper box, and and it, that there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, it just that this engine came from the factory with 20 horsepower, so to try and get considerably more than that out of it stresses things that weren't meant to be stressed like that. So yeah, the, the, the originally the, the engine was 20 horsepower from the factory. And through the uh, modifications and changes that were improvements that were made to the engine, they estimated the horsepower output to be somewhere around 150 horsepower, which with the speeds that they were going and that kind of thing is probably pretty realistic. Of course, they were running methanol too, which gives you 16 and a quarter to one compression ratio and methanol and, and uh, you know, that kind of helps on the horsepower output too. <laughs> This car sat for over 40 years just a stone's throw away from here in Apple Valley in a backyard. Then I think we wouldn't have made it if we didn't have the help of Karen and Kurt and other people of the family. They had beautiful pictures, big. And so it helped us, you know, restore it perfectly. In fact, there's a few things that are really interesting, even like the tailpipe that sticks out in the rear there was wire and they just perfectly wound it the same number of wines and the hood underneath the hood is uh, World War II aluminum. They did the decal exactly like they, it was in, in 1948. And uh, Kurt had a lot of great stories also and was kind enough to give a few parts of the original car to us. This car, it was incredible because the chassis was a Rosetta Stone because it indicated every modification along the way so the chassis was intact the tail was intact it had bonneville stickers and the last version of this car even had von dutch pinstriping on the nose in spite of the fact that this car went from a dry lakes racer solely a dry lakes then it went to drag racing and it went to the salt flats bonneville when they were restoring the car they unscrewed the belly pan and lo and behold what comes out dust and dirt and that tells you that it wasn't salt and it wasn't asphalt powder but it was El Mirage dirt. That's when we modified the car, and just before we finished it, yeah. The engine. Like and there's Duke. There's Duke Halley. Behind with your back to you. Yeah. Oh, here it comes. Oh, now, this was a, we took, yeah, that's when we had a little race car. Yeah. There is no way that this car could even be driven. And, and the, we knew the motor was good, so we sent the motor to John Beck of Chico, and he dynoed and cleaned it up, made sure everything was right, working, and then got that back. And through him, he was working on my Cobra motors. And I said, who's the guy to go to? You know, he says, well, Jimmy. And so went to Jimmy for Cobra work. And, and then eventually I said, we got to get the Spurgeon in and got to get it working. It's kind of my forte. I, 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 these early 20s, 30s, 40s vehicles that raced in the 40s and 50s, that's where my, my heart really beats. That's my passion. And I was uh, very pleased to get a phone call from John Beck, and he told me about Ernie and Elaine and, and this car right here. And if I would be inclined to be involved in... The car had already been restored, but to make it run and drive... Oh my God, what an honor. So that was my introduction to Ernie and Elaine Nagamatsu. And 
we've got this car here and it showed up and it was beautiful but it was just there's some final tweaks and stuff just things needed to be addressed to actually make it run and drive and and not harm the integrity of the car i mean that was first and foremost it's that was paramount as ernie would say it needs to be maintained it has to be we, we can't harm the integrity of the car so we, we did a couple things to it uh one of which was the carburation. The carburation that's on the car right now is for the sole purpose of being able to drive it so we can do things like we've done today. First time in 68 years, I believe, this car's been on the El Mirage dirt in this form. So we actually made a little manifold that bolts directly to the head, but it just bolts on. It utilizes all the same linkage, everything. So the other carburation that was on it when, it, when the car was on methanol can be bolted right back on the same fuel line, same everything. But again, for the purpose of doing this, we had to make it a little more user-friendly for us guys. I always say that we're, we're only custodians and guardians and stewards of physical things, but sometimes it's also with that is designated responsibility. That means that when I started looking at the, all the articles in Hot Rod Magazine and everybody started pitching in, we felt no shortcuts. We gotta do this right because it represents two families and it's we pay respect and we honor that and res with that respect comes this unwritten responsibility don't mess up no shortcuts do it all right and this car is exceptional it, it is sure beauty I think everybody would agree just looking at it, the elegance of, of that for being 1948. So these are the things that endear us even more and light the fire and passion.